All righty, thank you. Um, so if we could start with you stating your name. My name is Gary Davis. And what years were you a teacher at Linda McKinley and what did you teach? I taught black history and I believe it was called American government at Linda McKinley from September 1970 through May, June 1971. Okay, and can you talk to us a little bit about your methodological approach to teaching black studies? And you mentioned wanting to encourage or nurture positive attitudes in your students. And I wondered if you could talk about what those positive attitudes were. After graduation from uh, Central State, I had an offer uh, from Linda McKinley or from the school board to uh, teach at Linda McKinley. That's where I performed my substitute, I don't know, it wasn't called substitute teaching. I guess it was your practicum, leaving out of college, going into uh, high school to do your, your final degree work, as it were. Uh, so I did my practicum at Linda McKinley in uh, May, April, May of 1970, and the uh, individual for whom I was taking uh, her place at the time she had broke her leg. She ended up coming back to Lynn McKinley the following year, so that's why uh, I guess they offered me a position in September. Uh, towards your question, and you asked uh, what was my approach uh, toward teaching. I think I kind of explained that it was eclectic at the time. I, when it came out, they didn't have a uh, black studies curriculum or black history format, and so it was uh, eclectic on my part in terms of how was I going to approach uh, this black studies program. Um, so I took a simplistic approach. Uh, I thought perhaps if I began to dispel misinformation, provide them with some accurate information, it would begin to address certain attitudes that youth would have. And if you change, and my belief is, and I think there's a, probably enough empirical studies out is that if you provide proper knowledge, factual knowledge, you begin to address folks attitudes, hopefully in a positive way. And if you address folks attitudes, you begin to address their behaviors. And so I would begin simply with that kind of approach with the students, find out what they knew or find out what they thought they knew, address that through discussion and presentation and interaction with each other, and then we would move forward. Can I give an example, for example? Sure. Uh, for yes. example, in black history, if I were to ask a group of students, uh, have you ever heard that, and as it relates to American history being one of the same, black history being a part of, if you were to ask students, uh, are you familiar with the, the name Jocko Graves? How many of them would know anything about Jocko Graves? Well, then I would say, most of them would say no. Well, then what about the, the lawn boy holding the lantern? And then I would get a reaction to them about that lawn boy holding the lantern. And then I would tell them that that was a depiction of Jocko Graves. And then I would have to tell the story about the Revolutionary War, Washington, you know, and Trenton, the whole nine yards. And by the time the discussion, that might last a whole 45 minutes, but by the time the discussion ended, they'd have another opinion about the lawn, the lawn boy, or whatever they wanted to call him at the time. They'd understand that it was Jocko Graves. They'd also understand that Jocko Graves had an important role in American history, along with his father and the other uh, freedmen who came up to support Washington at that time. And then they also began to take a look at their role in terms of being Americans. How that part of being an American or being a patriot at the time, they weren't necessarily Americans, American hadn't come about at that time, but how being a patriot was significant. And so you began to kind of put stories that have been left out of history into perspective so they can understand from whence they come. And once you know your history, then I believe you're more prepared to deal with your future. I hope, I, would, I hope that wasn't too long of an explanation. No, that was, that was wonderful. Um, then can you speak to how the students responded to your approach? Good. 
this has to, it has to be, I guess, what you call a subjective and a qualitative kind of response. Subjectively, I think they responded well. Uh, the interaction, even students who may not have been performing well academically, they took part in terms of the discussion and they were able to take part. And I thought that was even more beneficial as long as an individual can kind of relay uh, to you what's going on with them. I think that's as important as whether or not they know how to write it down and get all the words right, etc. And keeping in mind that I wasn't an English teacher, but I had to give out written assignments and I had to get it back so you got a good understanding of uh, who could verbalize or express what they wanted on paper versus who was good at fe giving you some feedback on what they understand but just couldn't put it on paper. You follow what I'm saying there? Okay. So I ran into a lot of that in terms of students' ability to be able to uh, receive the information and to tell you what it is that they have received, i.e. Uh, what do they call that now? English comprehension. Uh, they would say, you know, I can read it, but I can't give it back to you after I read it. So we kind of had to work on that. But in terms of the program being a success, is that where that question is leading to? I tell you what, I had two experiences there, and both of them with, with white students that I think will stick with me. One was a young white student came to me, and he had math problems. He had taken a math test, but he couldn't figure out how come he didn't, he missed these questions over here. I wasn't a math teacher. I was in American, American history, black studies. But the mere fact that this young white youth came to me, you know, I thought was significant. So sure, I'm going to help him. But what I found out working with him was, it was multiplications. And when he came to the number six, he had difficulty in terms of, it was his times table, or if he had to divide six into a number. And so it was always the number six. But everything else was fine, but he was stumped, stumped, stumped over the number six. And after we kind of worked together, I said, well, give me your time. So we went through all of that, and finally he got a hold of it. But the piece for that was, I wasn't a math teacher. I wasn't a white teacher. He came to me, and to me he was a stranger, but he came to me asking me for help. That kind of speaks to, I think, where that whole white and black issue was. You know, I was glad to see that, and, and I felt great being able to help him with that. Part two, a young white student came to me right before the black history play, and he said, Mr. Davis, the wood shop is putting on I, I, some kind of contest that they were having. The wood shop was having a contest, and I want to be able to enter it for black history but I don't know what to uh, make. Can you give me a suggestion? This is a white kid. So I said, well, why don't you make a heart and put a fist in the middle of it and call it straight from the heart? And he kind of talked about what it looked like. He entered the contest, he won, and gave me the plaque. Up until a few years ago, and it happened because, you know, I go from Central State to Cincinnati, wherever I was going, I had that plaque and it stayed over my mom's house, where I currently I own the house now, and I can't find that plaque. But when I when I got this thing about the documentary, I tried to find it. It might be in one of those boxes. But I kept that plaque all of these years because he wanted to participate somehow on that black, black history level. He just didn't know how to reach out and communicate or what he wanted to do. Do you follow what I'm saying? That was probably the most significant, well, one of the most significant events that happened to me there because, because it let me know that white kids wanted to know more or find out how they can be engaged in black awareness, black experience. You follow what I'm saying? So when I, that's what I'm saying. So when people came to me with this race riot, then I had a problem. I said, well, I didn't see that, but maybe, you know, am I being too naive or was I in a bubble? You know, I'm trying to figure out where all that was because I saw how they responded. And then three, we had black kids in the play. I mean, white kids in the play. And they came and volunteered, knowing that they would have to be either the plantation owner or the slave trader. If you follow what I'm saying? They were willing to participate in a play, even though they knew that they were going to have to be cast in a negative role. 
that says something to, I think, their interest in black history, or at least showing how they wanted to participate in that black awareness effort, much like what we see now happening in the streets. You've got more white people demonstrating than blacks in Portland and, what was that, Seattle? I mean, for me, that was a, that's, an, that's the eye-opener. So anyway, let me back down in a minute. I, you asked me a question. I hope I answered it in terms of that. You did, absolutely. And, and actually, that leads into my next question is, you know, um, Simone mentioned this kind of rapid turnover, um, a rapid change in terms of the Linden community. And I wondered if you could talk about <coughs> the changes that you saw in the racial makeup of the Linden community while you were teaching at the school. And then if you, um, did you see any racial tension at all? Did you, did you witness or pick up on any of that at all? Okay. I would, okay. I don't know about the, the community demographics. Uh, when I got there, I thought that it was at least 60, 40, 60 being 60% 60 black, 40% white. I don't know what it is, and that's why I thought, and when I put into my discussion paper, it would be nice to know what that makeup was at that time. Uh, because, to move into your second point, did I notice any racial tension? I didn't notice any racial tension. We had, I was the uh, reserve football coach and the assistant varsity football coach. We didn't, I didn't see any racial tension on the field. Uh, I didn't have, I don't think, that many white kids in black studies. I may have had a couple in, in American government. But I'm not aware of, quote, racial tension as we know racial tension. There's going to be beefs. You know, black kids have beefs between each other. You know, and black and white going to have beefs. Every beef is not a racial, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a... I mean, if you have a beef with a white kid... I mean, I, I grew up with, with a young white boy at Hyle Avenue School here in Columbus, Ohio, uh, Columbus, Ohio down there on Whittier. We were in elementary school. Every day, he, he'd come up and he'd want to fight me at a certain spot. One day, during recess, these other white kids, and this was generally all white, came up and they wanted to fight me because I happened to kick the little whatever ball is when they playing dodgeball. I kicked it too hard and went the wrong way. They came up, they go fight. Who comes to my aid but the same little white boy that I got to fight every day because he wants to know, we're going to meet over in the alley? You know what I mean? I grew up not really understanding white people, seriously, because of that experience with him. He was the first kid I ever fought and had to fight him, I don't know, three or four times. But when it came to somebody jumping on me, he was the only one who comes to my rescue, as it were saying, if you fight him, you got to fight me. And I'm wondering, what's he doing? You follow what I'm saying? So I had problems growing up, because one of your questions was, how, how has this whole black experience affected you? From that time on, I really didn't know how to take white kids. And then I went to another white school where I was going to have to fight again. And there's always some white kids who are going to come up and stand for you, just like there's white people now standing for us at these other rallies. I mean, so I've always had problems in, in, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't be saying this because they don't tape, but I just, you know, I mean, it's almost like they're, they're different kind of people. It's like we may be different. I heard a question asked earlier that, today about that spiritual piece as it relates to the black awareness. I think uh, certain, I heard the gentleman ask a young lady about that spiritual piece. It really challenges you. It challenges me. I think that whole black experience at Lyndon McKinley challenged my whole spiritual awakening. And I guess at some other point we'll kind of get there. But toward your toward the end of your question, I don't know the racial makeup. I think it would be interesting to know that racial makeup there at the time, because it's my contention that there was only a, a small number of white kids that happened to dump. Uh, these leaflets down onto the bottom floor, followed by a small number of black kids who chased them out 
into you know wherever they went outside somewhere and that's where the beef began so I but I really don't, can't tell you about numbers because I was still inside on the uh, platform with the uh, rest of the play so um, so I want to I want to jump ahead and, and ask you about the students because there were a group of black students um, yeah. as I'm sure you're aware who were who were uh, who felt like there were things that needed to change things that they wanted to change they felt like there were things that were unjust that were happening um, and these are also students who met regularly at John Wells house to discuss politics and ideology and current events um, were you aware of this group and and what were your what are your memories of them one, I didn't know about it when I read your list of questions. I was, listen, I was shocked because that almost puts the whole thing that, when I talk about it being a success and being able to change attitudes and behaviors, and then when I read the part where that was presented as they were meeting separately and holding a meeting, I wouldn't want to know what kind of meetings were these and what were they talking about. But you just said they were talking about ideology and politics and all that. Well, I guess that's positive, you know, I didn't know anything about that. Now, John Wells, and I think I told him once, maybe a year ago or so, when he called and touched base every few years or whatever, I said, you know, uh, I happen to be thinking about the time that you came into my office, I'm talking to John Wells now, and I said, when you came upstairs in the room and you said, uh, Mr. Davis, I had met with, uh, I guess his name is Brother Ross, I'll call him Brother Ross at Ohio State, and uh, we've been talking, and uh, he was, and he's a professor there at Black Studies, by the Bing, by the Boom. And I thought at the time, and he just kept talking, you know. And I thought at the time that, that was real good because at least now I would be able to get the resources I need, like films, maybe some speakers to come in, that kind of a thing. So I'm looking at his his community outreach or his outreach to uh, other resources as a good positive thing. And I, I apologize to him. I said. I apologize to this day because I'm thinking had I acted upon your suggestion at that time and called Brother Ross or you give me a number or whatever, I might have been able to uh, squash some of this had I known what was going on or if nothing more, be able to put together the curriculum that I needed to put together by the end of this year. So I thought it was a good positive thing, you know, and I thought it was, I was kind of lacking in the, in the sense that what we're talking about is now that I thought now the kids is getting the information they need and they're starting to change their attitudes, their behavior is changing because at least they're coming to me with this kinds of good information. Do you follow what I'm saying? So from my bubble or from my perspective, I'm thinking all is well, you know. And so when this event happened in terms of what happened at the auditorium, it kind of threw me for a loop because I was thinking, well, what is it that the white people are mad at? Are they mad because we're trying to provide black studies? And that's where I kind of got involved. But we got a right to know our history. It's not a false history. Jocko Gray's being an example. Crispus Adox being an example, et cetera, et cetera. Are they mad because we now get black history? And that's that was my kind of beef, and that was my role in it, to make sure that black history is a part of our academic studies program. So, so when I heard about the John Wells, when I read that, I, you know, I didn't know what to think initially. But then I'm thinking now, well, maybe this, the individual who happened to be the white student and John had some kind of beef going on. I don't know. So now I'm, you know, so now I'm kind of thrown for a loop in terms of was there any racial tension there that maybe I missed. Um, well, to that point, um, could you talk about the Black History performance in February, uh, the Black History Week performance in February of 71, and um, were you there? What did you see? And, and, and what happened after? Okay. Okay, I wrote the Black History play, so I was putting on the play. Is that the, what you're talking about? Oh, okay. Uh, well, what I remember is... We had worked real hard in terms of practices, and uh, I think we had props in the whole nine yards. And this play, the production was called, as I recall, 
from Africa to America, lost, stolen, strayed. And it simply kind of talked about the plight of uh, blacks from the time that the uh, slave traders came to the shores uh, the, of the Ivory Coast, put them in chains, put them on the boats, brought them over here. A little bit about the plantation life with some singing songs, you know, Old Man River, or whatever we were singing at the time, that kind of a thing, with some interaction between uh, various students and, uh, playing roles. That was basically the play. I remember when it got to the part, now, so after going through the uh, middle passage and uh, some of what was going on on the plantation, I remember now that uh, I had a group there and we were singing a song, it might have been, a, I don't know, Swing Low Sweet Chariot, for example. Next thing I hear is a rumble in the balcony behind me and I hear, you know, oh, oh, gasp and, you know, that kinds of noise. And so when I turn around, I see paper floating down to the bottom auditorium. And I see about, one, two, three, maybe about six white students hanging over the balcony. And, I, and all you get to see is a bunch of others running out the back, you know, the balcony steps or whatever it might be in back. So my focus is more on just the ones who are throwing the paper down as opposed to how many is running out. But then I remember there were screams from young ladies down here and then I guess, you know, the rumble of when you get up out your seat and it flops back, you know, that sound and makes plank, 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 kids running out of the auditorium and then they went somewhere. But my role at that time was to squash the problems. So I think Bunch and I tried to squash the problems, say, listen, we're going to continue on with the play. We're going to do this, that, and the other, so forth and so on. So I think we went on to continue the play. And uh, after that, I don't know if we uh, had to clean up behind ourselves, you know, because we had a lot of props. I don't know if we had to clean up. But after that, then I remember going back on upstairs in the room. But So I can't tell you what went on outside other than what I've heard, but that's what went on inside that I can recall. And did you have a chance to look at one of the flyers? Did you read? One of the, any of them? No, but I'm glad you mentioned that because that probably gets to one of my conspiracy theories. Has anyone, well, I guess, or do I have to wait till the documentary comes out to find out whether or not those were professionally done or were they handwritten? Uh, you know, because that to me is real important, number one. I think that at the time, well, I don't know if we had a whole bunch of Xerox. I mean, we probably had those kind of machines that, you know, you got to do that and zip the paper on out. So were they professionally done or were they handwritten uh, because that might then lead to where they had that done. Maybe Brother Bruce told you, am I getting off the track here, but Brother Bruce? No, that's fine. Okay. I was given a uh, something from it was either the Linden News or Linden Community News or it was the Columbus Citizen Journal at that time where they had in the paper about the disturbance up there and said, and vice principals, uh, Bruce Bunch and Gary Davis, or vice versa, uh, resignations were called at that time. They put us in the paper at this, it was either, like I say, the Linden, some kind of news, or in the Citizen Journal, put Bunch and I name in the paper, blamed us for whatever activities going up there at Lynn McKinley, and then called for our removal. Well, they got four birds with one stone. I wasn't the vice principal. It was Brother uh, brother Brown. And I forget, what was his uh, name? And another brother who was a vice principal at the time. I, I forget his name. Good brother. But anyway, uh, they put us in the paper. My thought was, whatever the young man's name is who was in charge of dumping all the paper down, probably had some connections with that news source, the one, that paper news source up there, to, you know, if those things were professionally done, and then followed up with that with the report in that little paper, as well as maybe having a lot to do with how the messaging went out from there in terms of the Columbus Dispatch or the Citizen Journal, you know what I mean? Called, I got a scoop for you, what went on Lynn McKinley, and they were putting it all wrong. So part of that was the messaging, you know, I mean, all we had was WBKO and ABC, NBC, and CBS. So, uh, I don't know, I, I'll leave it kind of right there. I don't know, 
I don't know the individual everybody says was kind of in charge of that whole counter play thing, but I'm thinking that he had a lot of support uh, if it was professionally done. So to my to the best of my recollection, um, I remember one of the subjects, and I would have to go back to my notes, but at least one person did say to me that they were run off, like on a, a the old uh, what do you call it, like a mimeograph machine, right? Okay. That they were they were run off, they weren't handwritten. Um, and you raise a very interesting point about the level of support because at least one person also did speculate about that, um, about whether or not there was support maybe from someone in the school even. Um, but it's you know it's it's a it's a gray area. Right. But um, it just he kind did of have a car waiting for him outside though. Yeah, exactly. and th yeah, that's the other thing is that they right. they did uh, have getaway cars. And how long did it take before um, the police showed up? That was the other thing because. After I left, I can remember one of the questions you asked, uh, or somebody asked, was, "Do I recall at what point the um, National Guard showed up in my office, or National Guard showed up and the students ran up to my office to, to inform me?" Well, after the play, immediately following the play, I guess the, there were kids out front, both black and white, beefing about what went on in the auditorium. My, and my understanding is that the police showed up. So my question is, how soon did they show up from the time, you know, I mean, these kids ran out the door? If, the, if there were already cars waiting on a getaway, maybe somebody across the street or down the street knew that when these kids ran out the door, called the police. And if that be the case, and the National Guard show up, you've got to be on ready with the National Guard. You just can't make calls, say, hey, National Guard, we'll... You know, so does, does that mean that Linda McKinley was on the ready from downtown with the National Guard knowing that there's going to be problems? You follow what I'm saying? So, I mean, the whole thing at that time began to look real. This is my mindset at that time. You know, it's like, what the National Guard doing coming here? And where were the police? When I went out, I, am I talking too much? No. Okay. Please. One of your questions was, one of the questions that was prompted me on that paper that I received via text was, what did you do when the kids ran up? Well, there were two kids ran up and opened up the door. At this point, I can't tell you whether they were white or black. I just remember them peeking in the office. Peek, I called it my office, peeking in my room. And one said, Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis, the National Guard is here and they're looking for you. And then they ran down the hall. And so I sat there, like I'm sitting here now, trying to figure out what the National Guard doing here, you know, uh, what's going on. If anything, it'd be the police or whatever they want, you know. So I'm sitting there, and then I don't hear anything in the halls. And so I walk my hall, go down and, and listen. I don't hear anything. I go down steps and I listen. I don't hear anything on the second floor. I come back upstairs. I recently asked uh, a friend of mine who lives in the neighborhood now who went to Linda McKinley at the time, what happened after the play? Did the National Guard ever show up or did the police show up? Who showed up? Because to this day, I don't know if National Guard ever showed up. And he said, well, yeah, they were outside. I said, well, my room was in the back and I'm looking out at the football field. I don't see any and there's none on the side. And then I look down and there's none in the back. And he said, well, we were out front. Well, if you know, so now I got a problem because in my thought is when National Guard show up or the police show up, they're going to surround the area. They go on quarter off there, you know what I mean? But all that wasn't happening. So that's why I didn't, you know, I didn't see what other folks are saying. Like I can say I think I must have been in a bubble since my room was way in the back, but I didn't see everything that folks are saying they saw up there during that time, if you follow what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, I do follow what you're saying. Um, that's, that's interesting. And I will look into the, the time how much time elapsed from the white students running out and driving away to the to the police coming? But it does sound like there was some level of preparation. Um, so I think um, I want to move a little bit later into the year um, and ask you about the march to Franklin Park. Were you a part of that? Were you involved um, in that at all? The only march that I was, uh, and I didn't march because I don't. I don't march, I prefer to drive and get there. 
was one, there was a meeting down at a church somewhere, I think it was off Cleveland or wherever it was. I don't know. Anyway, I attended a meeting there and they said that they were going to march to, to Linda McKinley. And I can't even tell you what the nature of it was. I hope that the nature of it was is that they were protesting to say that we had a right for black studies at Linda McKinley or here in Columbus, Ohio. After all, my understanding was this was the pilot project. So you see, I had an investment in it, and that's why I kind of take it personally, you know, like when I hear race right now, because that's what, but anyway, they marched from the church, I think it was supposed to be up Cleveland Avenue to, what is Lynn McKinney on, Duxbury now? I'm, I'm, I can't remember, to Duxbury, at, but I drove my car. By the time I parked, and I think I parked, I may have been close up there to Hudson on one of those side streets, I come, I get out of my car and I walk down the side street, whatever that side street is at Lynn McKinley, and I'm coming across the grass. And as I come across the grass, I see about four or five guys kneeling down on the ground, and there's a flag out in front of them. One of them has got a lighter where they're trying to light the flag. And so I run over and I say, hey, we're not here for this, and you know, whatever, whatever. And they say, okay, man, okay, man. And at that point, I knew that these wasn't, Lennon McKinley students that I'm talking to at this point because all of them know me and they're going to say, no, Mr. Davis, you know what I'm saying? But these say, no, man, okay, man, okay. These have been some of those belligerents or scallywags that, we done, that they done picked up marching up Cleveland Avenue. You follow what I'm saying? So when I walk away and then I go over here and come walking this way, then I hear a bunch of ruckus. I look back over, they started lighting again. That's when I threw my hands up and said, uh-oh. It's out, of, it's out of work. I head on back to the car, knowing then that whatever, whatever, it's getting ready to go downhill. At that point, I knew things was getting ready to go downhill. So, that's about the end of my marching. So, so at that time, and the, the meeting that you're referring to, the community meeting, I wondered if you, uh, before we go forward to the flag, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that meeting. And do, to your recollection, was that at Mount Hermon Baptist Church? Yeah. I can't, all I remember is I was there, I was at a meeting, I thought it was off of Cleveland, not on Cleveland. No, Cleveland? Thought, huh? Wherever it okay. was, um, yeah. All I remember is I remember being there I think maybe I may have had to say something, but I don't even remember that. But I, then I remember getting in the car and going down toward Cleveland and heading up, I don't even know what that street is, to go all the way up to Cleveland Avenue. The street right before you get to the freeway, whatever that is. And I think I went all the way up to uh, Hudson Avenue, made a right turn, came down, and parked some way way up there. But. I don't even remember anything about the meeting other than I know I was there at that one. I know I wasn't there at uh, Franklin Park, at least I don't think I was there because I was kind of, if, because I'm thinking the march happened way before this May march that you're talking about, right? Well, there was, there was, the march to Franklin Park happened on May 19th. It was a celebration. They were going to a celebration of Malcolm X's birthday at Franklin Park. And so that was the purpose of the, that march. Okay, I don't know if I would have been a part of that. That was something for Malcolm X? Yeah, it was It was for a commemoration of his birthday. And the students left Linda McKinley in the morning and, and marched to, uh, black students primarily, marched to Franklin Park. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, well. So, so let me ask you this. Um, aside from the youth that you saw trying to burn uh, the American flag, mm -hmm. do you have any memory of the flag being switched when there was the black nationalist flag flying at Linda McKinley? And I will backtrack and say that in talking to Donald Vassar, um, he and another one of the, the former students mentioned that there were some people that wanted to burn the American flag and they stopped them from doing that. They felt like that was not the right thing to do and that's not what they were interested in. But they did switch the flag and 
and ran the red, black, and green flag up the flagpole. So do you recall that at all? Was this at that thing that I'm talking about? This. It was It was after the church, after the meeting at the church. Oh, okay. Well, see, I had left by then. Once I tried to stop them from burning that flag, and I walked away, and I saw that they went back and they were doing it again. And I knew that they weren't Lyndon McKinley students, at least. I can I don't think they were Lyndon McKinley students because none of them addressed me as "Hey man" kinds of stuff. But once I saw that you know that they were trying to do it again, I went on the left. So no, I wouldn't have any doubt that 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 they may have done that because things seem to be out of control. I mean, as soon as I got there, it wasn't even like it was a march. It looked like it had turned into something completely different from what it was down at the church. And maybe that's why, I, you know, I, I, I don't like being a part of, I'm not going to be a part of marches because you always get those and you can tell them running around with no shirt on, hollering and screaming, hopping and bopping, you know what I'm saying. You see them on TV now, you know, and you know, and the TV follows them. They don't even have, they follow them because they know they are the belligerent ones. You know what I'm saying? You can always tell them. And all you need is one or two of them to get close to some who are on borderline. And, and I think those people probably borderline sociopaths you know they looking for stuff to do you know and that's what we ran into a bunch of kids out there and most of them might have been 19 20 21 young kids who probably graduated or didn't graduate and those were the ones who i'm thinking are the ones who kind of st struck the flame of this uh, where incident that we have here today i don't, I don't want to blame them completely uh, because I do think there are some lessons learned that I could have done better. And I think that's what kind of uh, maybe sets me back a while because I still blame myself partly for not being able to be a little wiser and see these events evolve. You know what I mean? It, hindsight is 100. Uh, so when I was telling John Wells, you know, I, I wish I had followed up on, on, on Brother Ross and, and been able to put together curriculum, because then we'd be able to move forward or seeing a lot of these things you're talking about. Suppose I'd seen that. What would I have done? Them running up the flag. You know what I'm saying? What could I have done there? So I guess in large part, I'm, I'm kind of concerned whether or not there was a certain inevitability about what went on with Linda McKinley and how that kind of speaks to, you know, our worldview and getting to the other part before we started about how does that then strike you in terms of your religious views, you know? But anyway, I keep getting off the subject, and I don't mean to do that. That's okay. We'll we'll come back. We'll come back around. Um, I did want to ask you. So, following the church meeting, the flag was switched, um, and it was the the next day after that at school when the police. Um, came to the school again and and this is the main event that i think everyone when they refer to the you know when they use the term race riot they're referring to this it really though sounds much more like a police raid so hmm. from what we were piecing together um that next day there was an assembly called by john wells and john whitaker um it was an unapproved unplanned assembly and that assembly was held in the auditorium and at some point it was dispersed and the principal advised students to go back to their classrooms um, and any outsiders to leave. And at that point, the police came into the school. Now, do you have a, a recollection of that, a memory of that at all? Well, uh, no, but you, meant, you mentioned outsiders. So you mean outsiders from who weren't part of Linda McKinley? They were in the school. Correct. Oh, Correct. Okay. Well, and that was that was. This is according to one of the other participants that I interviewed, and um, more than one of them has said that uh, Charles Ross was also there. He was Ooh. at the um, at the assembly, um, along with another administrator from Ohio State, um, um, Mr. Kelsey. I believe his first name might have been Richard. Yeah, Kelsey. Oh wow. Okay. Well, no. Kelsey. Okay, I don't. Yeah, so, so do you recall that at all? Like the police coming into the school and um, aggressing the students. Um, there were students that were that were hit. Um, at least, well, there were boys and at least one girl. 
you know, possibly more. Um, and there was a general, uh, from what was described to us by multiple, num multiple of the former students, it was pandemonium and it was chaos. And uh, for sure was, was traumatic um, for them. Well, maybe it was traumatic for me too. Maybe I wasn't there, but maybe, is that the day that the National Guard show up? Was that? The, um, <clears throat> the, or the and or the police. I mean, we've had descriptions of the police being in riot gear. We've had descriptions of them having gloves on and, and coming in with their, with their uh, billy clubs out already. Um, and, you know, teachers trying to protect students, teachers trying to get students into classrooms. Um, it, it, you know, sounds like it was quite chaotic. Wow. I'm sorry, I, you know, like, you know what? One of your questions was, how did it affect you? That might be something that affected me right now. I, you know, I just kind of blacked that whole thing out. And it might have been then, if, when the National Guard showed up, or, or is supposed to have showed up. But once again, for me, that was a traumatic experience. I can't tell you, other than the play, the march, what happened there at Linda McKinley, I can't tell you what went on from February to the end of the year, quite frankly. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there's incidents that pop in my mind, but other than that, it was everything was downhill so fast, you know. I may have been may have been there, and maybe kids was up in the room or whatever. I don't know, and maybe that might have been the day when they came running to the. If I'm sitting in my office doing paperwork, then I really don't know what's going on downstairs when they're telling me. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't like I was involved in what's going on. I'm sitting in the. I keep saying my office. I mean my room. You know, okay. But that's what I'm saying. It was either I'm in a bubble, or. I'm, or I have some traumatic experience where I don't remember these kinds of things, but if you say it went on, then it must have went on. Well, can you talk about then, um, you just you just uh, made a comment that from February to the end of the year, it, it, everything went kind of downhill. Yeah. Can you talk about the end of that school year and the circumstances under which you left and why you didn't return? Well, I can speak to the circumstances under which I left was at the end of the year, they didn't offer me a contract to come back. Uh, the circumstances, I, it wasn't like they, quote, fired me. They just didn't offer me a contract. Can I digress for a quick second? Because Absolutely. This, because this ties directly into another question you asked, how, how did it affect my life after that? that some, this is what I do remember. That summer, it could have been June or July, but that summer I, was, uh, I received a letter from a, from a school up north, and I want to say it's either Mansfield or Masson. It was one of those schools uh, that were known for football at the time. Uh, white school predominantly, uh, but real good in football, they were always winning championships. That's, so it was one of either Maslin or Manfield, something, one of those schools or something like that. Anyway, uh, I was offered to come up and in, uh, inquire or to apply. No, I was offered a position. They were going to offer me the position to do black studies, two classes, and be full-time football coach. Now, I was only the reserve coach at Linda McKinley. They wanted me to come up. I had two classes to do and then be full-time football coach. Don't you know I was so paranoid because it, it was an offer too good to be true? Don't they know that I just left Linda McKinley? Don't they know these people trying to blame me for everything that went on at Linda McKinley? You want to offer me, and I, I'm not a... Coach, I was reserve coach, so it's not like I got head coach experience, but you're going to offer me this at an all-white school? Don't you know I turned it down because I wasn't walking by faith and not by sight at that time. You follow what I'm saying? And, and to, toward what your brother was asking uh, the other young lady, Scripture regarding, you know, and try me now here with and see when I open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive. I wasn't thinking in those kinds of terms. I'm thinking, these people trying to set me up. 
they're going to get me far away from home. Maybe the plan, you know what I mean? In the back of my mind, all I could think about is what's going to happen to me if I have to move away from home. I'm taking my then fiance with me. We can make a new life. You know, you follow what I'm saying? I was paranoid about Linda McKinley for years to follow that because I thought folks were blaming me for what went on in Linda McKinley. And even to this day, I, until I read your, your what's name, I didn't know about all those meetings and what kind of meetings there were. You know, that's 50 years later. I'm still finding out about things. So, uh, but anyway, I, I just kind of thought I'd throw that in there. Hey, Keely, can we jump in right now? Is that okay? Yeah, jump in. You want to swap the card out? Yep. Okay. Um, Mr. Davis, so they're, they're going to change the memory card on the camera just so we're, we're not cut off, you know, in the middle no of, uh, of, of the interview. You're good. You're Thank good. you, Mr. Davis. My, my colleague, Doug, is a little bit nervous, and he wants to make sure we get every single thing. So mm -hmm. I apologize for interrupting there, so I'll leave you guys to it. It's no, yeah, no, that's good. Thank you. It's good. Go ahead. He says it's Thank good. You. Thank you. We're good. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Um, so, Mr. Davis, um... I guess I, I want to go back to uh, to the students. Mm. I mean, I, I can say from my perspective of having spoken to several of your former students um, that they all unequivocally thought they represented you. They spoke of you as somebody who was a support somebody who's who 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 was interested in in educating them and educating them in black studies which is something they all very much wanted and part of the problems that they had with the administration as they expressed to me and to us in these interviews was that they did not feel that the administrative the administration was in support of of sort of their agency and their, um, you know, the, the, the mainstreaming of black studies. And um, particularly for the students who had been there and who had lived through this, this, these shifting demographics. So perhaps when they started, Lyndon was, Linda McKinley was mostly white and then there was this rapid change. And so they felt, as particularly by 71, this school is majority black, and so the school should should reflect that. And they definitely all saw you as someone who, um, you know, really uh, enlightened them in many ways, um, enlightened them with regard to their own history, and and they found great value in that. I mean, I think you you. I mean, I hope that you know that, but I can tell you just from my limited experience with, you know, your former students, this is what I've gotten consistently, and this is what has been spoken in the interviews. Um, so, yeah, I wonder, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the students, and if you have recollections of any of them, uh, you know, in particular. So. John Wells, you spoke about John Whitaker, John Harrington, uh, Valora Washington, Zola Diggs, Donald Vassar. Zola Diggs, you um, know, uh, can I jump in? Sure. Uh, Zola, I think, was working with the gas company maybe about four or five years ago. Uh, she stopped over, and, and uh, since we grew up together, you know, she calls me Gary. She says, you know, uh, I came in your office, one, came in your room one time, and you helped me uh, with something. And I was trying to wonder what it was. And she told me, she says that uh, it was her father's checkbook that uh, I guess he was having trouble balancing. And I guess that means if you got problems balancing your checkbook, you know what that can mean in terms of your household expenses, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess what she said was, you helped me, you showed me how to do your, how to balance this checkbook. And I took it home and showed my father, and we. And from then on, things change. Those kinds of things, you know what I mean? It's it, separate, and I think I mentioned a couple of movies, separate from my role as a black studies te teacher or teacher of American government. It was that kind of interaction, just helping kids kind of grow and learn and move forward uh, on the, 
what on the most minute level. I mean, just to see a spark in their eyes in terms sometimes about, I get it, I get it. You know what I mean? That's all a teacher. If you're a teacher, that's all you really want to see is a spark or a smile. You know what I mean? It's like when you know that they have gotten it, you know that you you made a difference in their life. Now, I will say, now, that's part one. Part two, remember I said that I think uh, my contract with the school was at that time a pilot project. I don't, I can't remember any other school that was doing black studies. So we were kind of like the pilot project. That's why I'm kind of protective and defensive of it in terms of how I may approach. But, so I've got to give Columbus, Ohio School Board its kudos for at least having the audacity to want to attempt it. Do you know what I'm saying? Because from 65 through, I mean, 55 through 65, 67, you've got the Civil Rights Movement. In 65 through what we now know about 75, you've got this Black Power Movement. I mean, so in the middle of Civil Rights and Black Power Movement, you've got a conservative city like Columbus, Ohio, really, you know, willing to step out of there and try black studies. What I mentioned to you in the discussion was, but the system, even though, even though the school system was saying, sure, go for it, teach black studies, the system in terms of the police and maybe the, the corporations, et cetera, et cetera, weren't just set up or designed to deal with what happens with the aftermath after you give somebody some information and maybe, you know, maybe things get go awry. But as, as was discussed previously, after all those riots that had start popping up, Oakland, uh, Los, Los Angeles, Jersey, everywhere else in the six, early 60s, by 67, all governors had come together and they had formed what they wanted to call, I guess, their... Uh, resistance plan, how they were going to deal with riots and etc. You follow? So by 70, all these plans were implemented, and I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but as far as I'm concerned, what we had there at Lyndon McKinley was a little incident, but it was almost like a, a trial run for them to see how well, if we implement this here, how well can we control? Because you would think that Cleveland, Dayton, maybe even Cincinnati would be a lot more radical than Columbus, Ohio. But so what better place to try your policing techniques in, you know, than in a city where you've got mostly folks who are satisfied with the status quo. We ain't rich or nothing, you know what I mean? But we ain't got a whole lot to complain about. And that's why it kind of concerns me when, you, when I heard you say something about can you talk about the, the attitudes or the racial attitudes of kids that there at Linda McKinley at the time? I can't wait to see the documentary so I can find out, you know what I mean, what was going on. Les Brown, through WBKO, he, you know, I mean, he was, he was all the way live and kids liked listening to him and he, he would always emphasize, if you can't, uh, if you don't have something that you're willing to live for, you know, you'll fall for anything, you know, trying to quote Martin Luther King's word if, words, if a man hasn't found something he's willing to die for, then he's not fit to live, kinds of stuff, and the black power kinds of stuff. But in terms of the kids here, I don't think that they were near as far gone as Cleveland, Dayton, Cincinnati, because I went to school with some of those folks, you know. And I see from whence they come. They were a lot more hardcore than we are in Columbus, Ohio. And they tease us about how soft we were, you know, so to speak. So that's what I'm saying. Columbus was just a test ground. If you really want, I mean, but you saw what happened up in Michigan and other places. I mean, so if you really want to get live, you're going to take the National Guard and your policing politics up there. But you want to test it here on Columbus, Ohio, kids. But anyway, that's just part of my theory. I don't know that to be true, but I got to give the school system all the kudos for at least having the nerve to want to test it. But the system wasn't ready to deal with it in case of problems. Go. So I want to go back to something that you, uh, another comment that you made, and ask you about how your experience at Lyndon, um, hmm. at Lyndon McKinley, how did that affect or influence your spiritual awakening? 
where it let me know how far I had to go. Because of what happened, I guess I may have said to some, you know, when you say to your elders, you know, uh, well, that shook my faith. I, 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 that made me lose my faith kind of stuff. You've heard that term. And they would come back with the retort, well, if that's all it takes to lose your faith, you didn't have much to begin with in the first place. And you began to deal with little things such as that, little tidbits of what it takes to be a, a Christian or a warrior or what it takes to be a black man in the day. So, I mean, you got to start taking a hard look at yourself and figure out who you are, what you are, and how you're going to move forward from this spot you find yourself in, you know. And it took me a long time because I'm, I was dealing with all of those things about how, why me, you know, victim, you know, I'm the victim, you know. As I sit here now, I hear myself complaining. I don't like that, you know what I mean? But it's like all these outside external influences come in, uh, to what you're trying to do, and they got their hands in it. You know, I'm dealing with black history. Somebody else is dealing with black power. Somebody else is dealing with, you know what I mean? You got all these other, fo all these forces wanting to jump on one bandwagon, you know, and before you know it, everybody's taking the reins out of your hands, and, and you become a passenger. Well, you know, you become ineffective now. You're just riding on the wagon, and they call the wagon whatever they want to call it. The struggle has many names, black awareness, civil rights, black power, it, it all, you know, it's all the struggle. And they all get on that bandwagon together and it depends upon who's strongest or how many got the numbers as to who's driving that wagon, you know. And I just don't like to be driven, you know, and, and I've, I've become a lot more, I don't know what the word is, skeptical about marches and all of those other, because I look for those idiots running around trying to, you know what I mean, just trying to cause havoc, you know. But I am emboldened when I see how whites have gravitated toward the uh, black awareness movement. Even if it's not all about black awareness movement to them, what they're tired of is the fact that now they're getting to see it on on TV and they got to deal with it. They've got to step up and, and that's where we are in today as it differed from back then when it wasn't, you didn't see a whole lot of white people embracing, you know, except for walking across the bridge with Martin Luther King. You didn't see that, but now you see that more, which means that it's not a racial kind of a thing, it's a cultural kind of a thing. We're involved with a social cultural movement that is now taking root and whites beginning to empathize with the struggle we have because they're seeing more of it. Okay, yeah, well, thank you, because that was going to be my next question. I was going to ask you your thoughts on the demonstrations that we've seen, um, particularly this year, demonstrations against police brutality and, and racial violence, but also systemic racism. Um, and, I, you know, you're, you're not the first one of the people that we've talked to who, who's expressed surprise at the number of whites and other people who are not black who have who are participating in a lot of these demonstrations. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add about anything, whether it's the current situation today or um, what you see as the way forward or, or anything from the past? Uh, I, I, my hope is that your documentary uh, speaks to those issues which, which you want to come to the fore. But I think even more important than that, there's a bottom line about how we as people, I don't know, I, I can't, after all these years I can't even express it. It's man, he, man's inhumanity to man. And Dr. King wrapped it up, he says, and maybe one day uh, we'll be judged by the content of our character as opposed to the color of our skin. And it kind of gets all back to that, the color of one's skin being the reason why we got on the boat in the first place, well, you know what I mean? And I, and the struggle we've gone through all of these years because of the color of one's skin. And then the names that go with that, the Sambos and the this and the that and the degradation and all that, the humiliation that goes with that. 
you know, and they and then they listen, listen. It, it's just too much. You know what I mean? After all these years, I ain't used to it yet. You know what I mean? It's but the saving grace is not all white folks is like that. You know, and and you and they'll stand up for you if you can find them. I mean, they'll stand up for you, and, and I, you know. I just can't figure it out. After 71 years, you know, I'm still kind of stuck on where I am. With That's why I believe it's almost like a spiritual thing, you know. It's good versus evil. Good's going to win out sooner or later over evil. But only if we change the hearts of man, you know. It's got nothing to do with the words that we're putting out. Is it, is it a riot? Is it a demonstration? Is it a peaceful day? Yeah. It's good versus evil in terms of my book, you know what I mean, and, and how we deal with that going forward. But I want to thank you all for allowing me a chance to uh, come share. I hope I didn't ramble on too much, but like I say, I'm kind of defensive and I was, uh, you know, so I just thank you for the opportunity to come and share with you today. No, we, we thank you. Uh, we appreciate you coming. We appreciate you sharing your perspective. Um, there, you know, all of that, the, your perspective in its totality, because that's important. Um, you were a person who was in the school at the time and we, you know, that's what we want to know about. You know, there's no, there's no, there are no wrong answers and that we want to know how you felt, how you feel, and what your perspective is. Um, Alan? Yep, I'm here. Did you have any questions for Mr. Davis? Sure. Thank you, Celia. I just wanted to follow up really quickly. Uh, you mentioned a number of things that really kind of resonated with me. You talked about, you You were talking about Dr. King. You talked about his argument that, you know, the, that, um, that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you were referencing. And then you, you talked about his idea of, um, of, yeah, being judged by one's character, right? Confident one's character as opposed to the color of the skin, some powerful stuff. And you referenced the question I asked Simone earlier. It's interesting. So my big interest has been the intersection between the things that people read and how it affects their behavior, specifically their activism, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I was asking Simone earlier, I don't know if everybody got what I was really asking, because I'm not a, um, I study and all that, but I'm not an evangelist or mm -hmm. <laughs> fundamentalist or anything like that at all. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the point. My question was, I wondered if growing up in a house, we're studying things so closely and looking at how they're applied and how they're interpreted affected her mm -hmm. and made her a more um, avid or analytical reader or critical thinker. Right. Because that's the effect that I've seen in some cases. I've wondered about right. that. So that was my idea. And so right. with, with some of your former students, the question I asked, I wondered if there were things that they read that inspired them towards activism that affected their critical thinking, their approach in one way or another. I try not to plant the ideas, but what I'm really trying to find out is what they read that affected their engagement. Mm -hmm. You're right. If there was any relationship. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I, mm -hmm. It, it, right, and and I wonder if you think that there's anything anything that you assigned along the way um, in your classes as reading, or anything that you read along with them that you feel may have impacted their willingness to engage in activism, as Simone said earlier, not to um, go along just to get along, mm -hmm. but to stand up. Mm -hmm. What I think is important to remember is that we're looking at 1970, and once again. Uh, the two phases that I look at is what we want to call the civil rights movement was from historians will say 55 to 65 and then they'll say the black power movement was from 65 to 75. Well if you just take a look at that we overlap basically the civil rights movement with this black power movement and the kids are living this they're not they don't have to quote read it they can look on the TV and, and they can see the the recent riots popping up here and there. They see what's going on north in Michigan. So it's not so much about what they were reading, it's what they were experiencing. But I just wonder, you talked about how your students, well, you didn't have to assign anything. They were living it. They were surrounded by it, right? Mm -hmm. But that happens for a lot of us, I think. But I remember being surrounded by things happening, but reading Malcolm X was right. transformative. And so I wonder if there are things that you assigned like that, perhaps, that where you had interactions with your students, where they communicated that to you. Or I wonder also in your own journey, if there were some particular things that you read that led you to this work. Uh, well, in terms of the assignments, when we uh, when we do it, did American history, or when we with American history, you take certain incidents in American history, such as the Middle Passage. 
I would want them to read about the Middle Passage to find out exactly what was the needs of the British colonies, uh, the American colonies, what were the needs of Africa in terms of why this whole slave trade came about in the first place. What was the need? Once it was over, and then since we didn't have, quote, books, I think many of them enjoyed going to the library. I think her name was Miss Jacobson. I was trying to think of that name. I think her name was Miss Jacobson at the time, who was a librarian. She was real helpful with students and me in terms of being able to find resource material. When I'd ask a question and we didn't have the book, I think that's what kind of led many of them to get on the path of really wanting to learn and explore was that they had to go find the information in the library themselves. That was part of what, we, when I said that my teaching was eclectic, that was part of it to do the research itself. And the part about civil rights, I think many of them, if we wanted to talk about Martin Luther King and, and, and the marches, et cetera, I think through you can get most of that through the paper that, uh, in, in terms of what was going on with housing or schooling at that time. So it was, wasn't so much we had to depend upon uh, what we were getting from a curriculum as opposed to what we saw was going around us and we were trying to put together the information to come up with our own uh, way of thinking and taking a look at the situation. That's why one of the questions you asked or was asked of me, why do I think it was positive? I think it was positive because they came out thinking for themselves. Even if some of them may have had little sessions in their house talking about whatever, I don't know, at least they were talking. I mean, it wasn't so much as they out in the street running around doing nothing. At least they were, you see what I'm saying? At least now they were coming together and trying to have a conversation about the world in which they live. That's all they got to be positive. Uh, it'll be more positive if you knew what they were talking about and how you could help them along with the conversation. Mm -hmm. But the mere fact that they're trying to talk, I thought was positive. Now, one more thing. That was incredible. And I have to tell you, you know, well, we interviewed some of your students. We even interviewed them at Uncle John's house, and they were doing just what you said. They were trying to be SNCC, right? They were really putting in time to organize. They were thoughtful. They were focused. Yeah. That was good work, and yeah. it really mattered. It affected their lives. They they moved forward with that. And, you know, so it led me to my, to my last question, and I wonder, you know, sometimes when I teach um, African American history, I, there's some readings that have pretty profound effect, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a few different ones that I use. I use an excerpt from the end of Alex Haley's book, Roots, where they talk about um, the people being led away to slave castles and, and villages mm -hmm. being uh, raided. So I use that work, which is fictional, but still, mm -hmm. I use that core part for that. And then there's another piece that I use that's, that's fictional, written by Frederick Douglass. It's called a, a, um, The a Dialogue Between Master and Slave. And I have the students take on roles, and they read it and interact, and then we use it to interrogate the institution of slavery mm -hmm. and it's, it's been really effective for me mm -hmm. are there and students often come up afterwards and they engage and they talk about it mm -hmm. they talk about what they learn from it and i wonder mm -hmm. were there any experiences like that that stuck with you particular assignments that involved reading or a text in some way mm -hmm. that you used yeah. with related uh, the, to willie lynch, the willie lynch papers uh <laughs> because that sparks not only a certain amount of emotionalism and feeling it kind of puts them in touch with the reality of what happened to uh, how you not only train a slave, but what happened to a, uh, the young black boy uh, in the mama's arms or, or to grabbing hold of the mama's leg while he's experiencing what he's seeing about the lynching and how the mother feels about protecting her black child and tells her, from now on, I don't want you looking at these people in their eyes when they talk to you. You know what I'm saying? And so we, we grew up or our ancestors grew up with look certain folks in the eye because if you look them in the eye, then you might threaten them and then they'll, you're going to end up on somebody's pole, as it were. So a lot of those kinds of things, the Willie Lynch papers, I don't know, uh, Frederick Douglass, yes. Uh, the part, another one was Crispus Attucks. Who was he really? And some want to say he was a runaway slave, some say he was an Indian, you know what I mean? But it comes down once again to color. It doesn't matter, you know what I mean? He was a person of color, but they, they, tried, they can't figure out if he was a black man or was he an Indian, was he a runaway? Oh, he was a person of color, but they try to define him so. I mean, you know, they stumble all over themselves trying to find who we are and what our role is in American history. And I don't know if it's to minimize our role, so I mean, I kind of get off tangents when I try to uh, 
lock in on certain thoughts. But I mean, there's just so many different elements to the black experience or black awareness that you can grab a hold of and just kind of run with. And once a, once a kid gets a hold of it and that light comes on, you let him do the research and come up and teach a class, as it were, or tell you what they found. That is the kind of experience we're looking for. When, if it's no more than just, what do you think of when you think of the ghetto? And then they'll talk about the trash or, or the poverty and this and that. And you say, well, how does your home differ from that? You know what I mean? You get to thinking about, well, you know, I got trash in my yard and this and that. I had them out cleaning up the community one time, the street of Duxbury, just because they didn't want to be uh, uh, considered to be ghetto kinds of community. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, once they start internalizing this and seeing, you know, this is how people view us, you know, and we, we want to change that narrative onto something more positive. Just like we want to change the narrative from Jocko Gray's being that buffoon looking guy with the big white lips and all this kind of stuff holding a lantern into a hero. You know what I mean? We go from a buffoon to a hero. But you don't have to read a whole bunch in order to, but anyway, I, I'm getting off on another tangent. There's just so many ways in which education kind of evolved, you know what I mean? What did we do when we didn't have books? How did we teach? We teach through uh, metaphors, you know? How did Jesus teach? You know, he taught through metaphors, you, that kind of a thing. But anyway, uh, that's about where I was with that. But for me, it really, it really, if you don't have a spiritual foundation, it's kind of hard to, na to navigate this world we, we call the black experience. Because you got to pull upon something. You got to look toward the hills from whence comes your help. Like I say, I turned down things being paranoid because I didn't walk by faith and by sight. If I saw that job that I, I went to in Mansfield as the greatest opportunity and God opened the door for me because he knew I wasn't to blame for what, what went on there, I would come in with a different perspective and taking that job and my whole life would have been different. We probably wouldn't have been sitting here talking now about Linda McKim. You know what I'm saying? Because I had a whole different life experience but I was shaken to the core because of that experience and it just changed everything. So, I mean, uh, I'll be interested to see what you all say about this experience to see whether or not it kind of fits with my worldview as it were. Davis, that was powerful. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I, I would really like it if I could have an opportunity to talk with you again later. Sure. Okay. But uh, I'm going to let everybody, why well, don't we want to, to close things off and, and finish with you, but I'm going to be here, but then I'm going to pack up, walk over and meet you. And oh, I'll walk out right with you to the garage, here. make sure. Okay. Yeah. So make sure I'll, I'll run over and join you. I want to make sure you get out smoothly. Okay. Okay. Appreciate that. Okay. So, so I know we don't have uh, much time left at all. Simone, did you have any questions for Mr. Davis? No, nothing specific. Okay. Thank you for um, sharing your story with us and um, participating in this project. Well, I want to thank you. And listen, your father is a good man. And, uh, I just want to thank you. Yeah. He's the one who sold me on being a part of this this whole thing. And, and so I just want to thank him because it was something I wanted to get off my chest. Maybe I need to get off the chest. So I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of it too, Simone. That's great. Well, I'm really happy that there were um, some teachers and an administrator who were, were able to participate so that we had a mix of voices, you know, not just the students who were there, but some other people too. Oh, yeah. Dave Page, that was the other administrator. It was Tom Brown and Dave Page, and I, I think his name was uh, Principal Reed. You know, I uh -huh. felt sorry, you know, yeah, you asked me that question. I felt sorry in the sense that I don't think they could have controlled it any more than I could have controlled it. You know what I mean? I, I don't know how they would have known more than me, except they are on the bottom floor, and a lot of things that happened probably happened on that floor. But I don't, you know, I couldn't blame them at all for what went on or for their lack of being able to do anything, if at all possible. You know what I'm saying? It was, things went downhill, and I think they were just caught up with everybody else, and I couldn't blame them at all. I thought they did what they could do given the circumstance. You know, I do have one question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know you did not return to Linden. Correct. And where you landed next, were you able to teach? Were you ever in Columbus City Schools ever um, able to teach African American studies or black studies again? Or uh, yeah. were you shipped more to strictly social studies history in the you know, more traditional yeah. way? I began, uh, 
I did student teaching uh, right following, following that year. I went into student teaching and I also worked with the Columbus Recreation Department. Then I went into, and then I began to work with Reverend Fell Hill. You might remember him, had Union Grove Church over there off of uh, Governor's Place. Yeah. Over by Champion, over by yeah. Poindexter Village. Yes, and he was at the time Representative Fail Hill. He was in uh, the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, he began to mentor me, and I went off into the uh, political arena. And then finally, I landed over in uh, alcoholism, drugs, and mental health area. Uh, so, no, I never did go back to teaching primarily, but I was in the field of working with folks. So I guess that's still in health and human services. Well, thank you again, Mr. Davis. This, it was a pleasure meeting you. Um, I wish we could have met face to face, but I'll, I'll take this. It was a pleasure to, yeah. to, to get to see you and, and, and to hear from you directly about all of this. Um, and I will definitely be in touch with you as things move forward with the documentary. I may have some follow-up questions for you, but we'll definitely be in touch. And um, feel free, if you have any issues, you can re reach out anytime, um, you know, anytime at all.